Great. Okay. So welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's great to see many of you, some familiar faces and some new faces. Uh, my name is Catherine Townsend. I'm the executive director of Open Data Collaboratives, which is a consortium of individuals and organizations working to help open up government and increase civic participation and citizen participation uh, with data um, for better outcomes. I am uh, going to give a, a brief presentation today uh, about pitching a data-driven project for funding. Uh, so this is based off of uh, years of work previously with a previous experience working as a grant manager or giving out grants at USAID, um, which is the Agency for International Development and their team there called Development Innovation Ventures, which is looking at organizations that have an innovation and are looking to bring them to scale. Um, I've also worked with uh, data.org and running the, again, this is in a previous position, uh, running uh, a global challenge um, on inclusive growth and recovery, especially in the face of COVID. And all of these needed to be very data-driven. And so we looked for how um, how the projects came through and um, and set up a system for how to evaluate those projects. Um, and then most recently, uh, I've I've helped in my current capacity with the UK government on data for COVID vaccines um, in a group called COVID Action, and so just ran an open challenge on data for vaccines and for the vaccine rollout. So there's some common threads um, on what funders seem to be looking for. Uh, when projects for data-driven solutions um, are pitched. And I thought they would be helpful to go over uh, sort of the patterns that I've seen from those projects that are most well-received and actually get funding. So that is the purpose of today's uh, presentation. Um, so again, I'm just going to go through some of those top line findings. Um, I've written this in English and in French, I will not be delivering in French because um, my accent is embarrassing, but I thought if any of the French speakers were on, they would be able to follow along. And then um, if we have time, and I hope we do, I'd love to hear any projects that you are working on if we wanna workshop them and go through uh, kind of where they are and what your next steps are. Um, I think we'll have time for that. Okay, so any questions, please. Um, let me know, ask them in the chat. We'll get to all of them uh, after, and I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and hopefully you can see my screen. Okay, so the first uh, really important piece to be able to identify um, is specifically who are you serving? Um, this is important in your pitch, but it's also important for the, your own work. Um, a lot of projects start out with saying, here's what our product is. Here's what we're going to do in order to, um, you know, here's the solution that we have. And it's, it's quite evident that there's not a real person or a group of people who, uh, who has been identified as this is whose life is going to be changed or life is going to be improved by the work we do. And the problem is that with that, as you'll see sort of later in the in the presentation, is that it's very hard to measure or understand if that person or if that group has been affected. So being able to say specifically, here's who are, here's who we're serving. Sometimes this is called a stakeholder, um, uh, but being able to identify, it can be more than one set of people, but it's someone or it's some group of people that you can evaluate your work to say, yes, we did this or no, it did not. Um, okay, so sorry, that's uh, written out for anyone who wants to read along. Um, okay, and then defining the problem. So uh, uh, for this work specifically, um, are you saying something very broad, something very general? Uh, and that often comes across as well. So uh, for example, um, everybody needs to get vaccines. That's true. But what specifically are you trying, what specifically about that entire huge problem are you trying to address? Um, because if you try to solve everything, uh, or if anyone tries to solve everything, it ends up that uh, nothing really gets addressed. So being really specific about this is what we're going to work on, and this is what we're going to work on in a small amount of time. So it might be getting students registered. That's something very specific. You can measure against it. 
Um, and it is, uh, it is understandable exactly what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and then stating the solution. So this is a bridge that's kind of dropped in the middle. Um, there is a structure that uh, Mobile World Ghana team knows well, and anybody who works in the, in the data and tech industry, the if this, then that. And uh, what we found is that a lot of donors and a lot of, um, especially those that are looking at data-driven solutions and tech solutions really appreciate that framing. If you give me this, this funding, if you give me this data and support, then this is the solution that will come out. So being able to draw very specifically, if I am working on this project, and if I'm able to document all the uh, inventory, all the, all the students that need to get, uh, say, vaccinated or need to get support for services, then this is the outcome that will happen. So just being really, um, we say bounded, really uh, specific in what it is that you're trying to get done. Um, knowing your landscape. So there's a there's a sort of term, you know, a landscape is a view <laughs> that you have of, uh, of the world around you. Um, and that's also uh, uh, the sort of term that's used of all of the different organizations and individuals that are working in the space. That might sound very obvious. It was not obvious to me. So I just say something, say it to, to share as well. Um, so there's a term called landscape mapping, where what you do is you actually write out, here are the other organizations and here are the other individuals that are also working on this problem. Uh, because it's very rare that you've been able to find something that nobody else has tried and nobody else has worked on. The benefit of that is that you can form partnerships with them um, and you can work together. Uh, but if you, but any, any project that says we have, identified this problem and we are the only ones it's pretty rare that it's the the individual it's the it's the only time that that problem has been addressed so being able to demonstrate that um there's a an awareness of who the other actors are in the space and then it's much easier to say here's uniquely what we will be able to do um and it, you know there's a there's been a i'll just say a a, a word about the, the uniqueness. That's been given a lot of credence. That's been given a lot of support because of this idea that novelty is important, that innovation is important, that being different and new is important. That seems to be changing, which is good, because it may be that your product is very similar than another organization's product, but they're just not able to reach as many people. So your unique contribution doesn't have to necessarily be that you're completely different from anybody else, but that you're reaching a group or you're able to provide a service that just the current uh, field is not able to address. So um, that's what we'll say about the landscape. And then you build your coalition. So it is very rare that uh, your organization will be perfect at everything. Um, I don't know any that are. And those that are are often we're not even art, but those that attempt it are often so large that they have so many different kinds of organizations within their own organization that they can't, it's very difficult for them to even figure out how to work with each other. And they end up going and working with organizations outside anyway. So you can think of governments, you can think of large NGOs, even foundations. So with that said, what's really important to say, what am I uniquely good at? What is, what is this team really positioned to do. And again, thinking of who you're serving and who you're, what the problem is that you're trying to solve, what other competencies do we need? Do we need marketing? Do we need uh, sci data science? Do we need data cleanup? Do we need uh, you know, frontline people going out to ask for feedback in the community? Um, so being able to say, this is what we can do and here's what we need help from others. And then identifying which are those organizations that want to support you in that. Um, if you're working with governments or if you're working with any large organizations, letters of support, even small organizations, letters of support are very important. If you can get an MOU, that's fantastic because it helps, um, again, donors and funders recognize that this is a really, this is a legitimate relationship. You're not just saying, oh, I have a friend, I know someone, <laughs> they work with me, we've always worked together. 
that's probably you know that that can go very far but once um you get a donor who's so far removed from the problem that they don't know the relationships they want to see something on paper that says all right here's here's an official stamp here's an official seal that says um we're endorsing this this team and uh this project so um so that's the that's getting back to landscaping understand what you can do well understand who are the other organizations who could help you fill in those gaps and getting support from them um hopefully that's clear if any of this is not clear or you disagree with anything that I say that is always welcome um and please just note it make a note in the chat um love to discuss it with you uh and just we're about halfway through to give a, a check um building in feedback loops so a lot of times uh there will be a project that gets funded and it only has here's exactly what we're going to do over the next two years and here's how we'll be measured against everything that we say we will do. And there's very little space for here's how we will adjust uh, when something goes wrong, because something always goes wrong. Something always gets, I mean, this is life. Uh, things get changed up. Sometimes it's a global pandemic, um, which can be entirely unpredictable, but <clears throat> there's many things that can be known in a project um, <clears throat> where maybe a government doesn't share the information that said it was going to or uh, you have a, a group of volunteers that were going to help and then they had to and then it, it didn't work it fell through the you know the the seasons changed and it was physically impossible to get to um the part of the country that it, we were trying to work in there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons that um that progress gets halted and so in being able to say um how are we building in uh a uh, an understanding and what we call a feedback loop about is this working and does it need to change um and so that goes back to item number one is who are you serving so being able to have those people that you're serving give you feedback as the project is going along to say uh you know this doesn't seem to be helping at all or actually this is really great we'd love more of this work that you're doing and less of this work and you can at least make an informed decision about whether the approach that you've outlined at the outset is the right one and should be going forward or if it needs to be adjusted um this is called an agile process i'm sure you've heard of that quite often um and again because we're talking about data driven pro pro uh, programmatic funding we're talking about trying to get the attention of donors and tech companies um using the phrase agile is often very well received because that is the current sort of language at the moment but even so, it's good to have any project that has feedback loops because it is very frustrating to put so much time and so much effort into work. And then at the end realize if we'd adjusted six months ago, and if we changed, then we could have been more effective, but we didn't have any kind of process in place to evaluate and to change course. So really thinking about from the beginning, how are you going to check in, see how well you're doing and uh, adjust as you go forward. Um, growing the field. So there's a little boy pulling the other girl up, come and join me. And the other one's just sitting and looking. That's the purpose of that slide. Um, but basically, uh, you know, one thing that is really attractive is organizations that are thinking about who else is going to benefit. Um, how how does this grow the space overall? Now, a lot of investors just want to know how are you growing because we're investing in your organization and we just want your company and your company to do well, and that's fine. Um, but there are quite a lot that are saying uh, how is how is this adding to what's called the um, to a public good. Um, and to a global commons of people, of information, of work that is being shared um, so that others are benefiting and growing and learning as well. And so this gets into how are you sharing your information? Sometimes it's a marketing plan. Uh, sometimes people will just write, um, we're going to write a report and we'll tweet it out. We'll put a press release out at the end. Um, most organizations are not good at this. Um, that includes very uh well-resourced ones 
um, big governments and uh, and uh, multinational organizations. There's, it's it's hard to think about how are others going to learn in a beneficial way. But um, there's a there's a big value therefore in being able to say we know how to grow the community, and we know to how to share the work and the the impact that we've had so that others are learning as well. So that can just be <clears throat> the lessons from the process that you have. It can also be the data that you've collected and the data that you're actually sharing to learn. Um, so going into the media and marketing plan, touched on that a little briefly, but you really do need a media and marketing plan. Um, and I <clears throat> very much encourage having this in the project pitch is to say, you know, even if it's a few sentences of here's how we're going to share the work and here's how we're going to know that we'll share the work because marketing is often an afterthought and donors really want to see that you know not only does the project work but that there is a plan for how to um how to share the work so that others know about it because they want you to succeed sure they also want to look very good themselves that they've funded something that others have learned about um so there's uh there's that sort of double double incentive there um this can come into a question of, do you need a partner in this? Is there an organization that's really good at this that you need to work with? Um, but I always go back to sort of that initial question of who are you serving? So how are they learning about the work that you're doing? How are they sharing it with others? And how can you track that they're learning about it? Because just posting on social media and saying, oh, a lot of people saw this tweet and liked it or saw this LinkedIn post and, uh, and gave it a thumbs up, uh, doesn't mean that they've actually read through and they've actually absorbed it and they are, um, have learned from it. So being able to track what's the actual impact or you know, how, how are people actually learning about this work. And media and marketing can be very expensive. So kind of thinking of it as an afterthought, it can completely eat into your budget or request for budget, um, which we'll, we'll get to next. So uh, again, thinking through you know, who needs to learn about this? What are the, um, the audiences that you're trying to reach um, and how you reach them? It's important to have that lined up and uh, put, into your, put into your plan. Okay, this is a data. <laughs> this is a presentation and a discussion about how to get uh, funding for a data-driven project. So now we are finally talking about the data. Um, so there are plenty of projects that are really excited about working with great data sets um, and they're looking for funding to support analysis of those data sets and it is really hard to find those data sets um, as we all know from trying to get uh, data from different organizations externally that are supposed to be sharing an open way sometimes it's available sometimes it's not it's often not updated um, if it is updated it's not cleaned so um so that's one, if you're sharing, if you're speaking about a project where you're getting uh, open and pub public data, is it reliable? Can you demonstrate, we know for a fact that this is going to come forward in this time. And if, you're, if your work is dependent on that data and it doesn't come through, then again, just putting in the pitch, how do you, um, how do you have that feedback loop? How do you change the work um, if that data doesn't come through? Uh, if you're working with a partner and they say oh, we have um, you know hundreds of data sets about women who've taken our training course and uh and all of the um jobs that they've been able to get as a result of the work that they're doing where they have a new skill okay um now they might have said that they'll share the data with you but do you have a written commitment from them that they actually will share that data um can you show the quality of that data that they have uh again we'll see a lot of applications that say, for sure, we're going to get this, but then the actual process of who gets to look at the information, who gets to analyze it, um, and who gets to verify it, that can take months and months. So just making sure that you actually have the commitments of, um, of what that data is and, and how high quality it is. Um, and then uh, a lot of donors now would like to actually see what data you're using. Um, so they call it an internal data audit. Um, and, uh, you know, Florence and I, uh, Florence who's running the, this, this conference, have worked a lot with government data. Um, we've worked a lot with different data from many organizations. And we know that people's data can be very messy. 
Um, and that is not a question of funding or support. That is a question of organization. And, um, and it can be quite embarrassing to be able to show what your data looks like. Um, you might not want to show it, but uh, a lot are going to ask for it. So being able to really clean up and understand what data you have and being able to share your books is going to be really vital. Uh, so understanding what, um, so, so being able to be prepared for that internal data audit. Um, and once you have your, uh, your own information very, um, very organized, very clean, it's a lot easier to decide which, which is beneficial to make public um, and what needs to be internal. And so having a plan for, are you going to open the data? Are you going to make it the data open source um, or make the work itself, the process itself open source? Uh, again, all of that is, is um, currently very attractive to donors. So, um, all right. And then uh, data science. So there's a lot of, lot of work and a lot of, um, a lot of publicity about the benefits of data science. Data science is a, an, an enormous field and it encompasses a lot of different kinds of pro professions. Um, a data scientist themselves are often said to be at the intersection of someone who has um, a, sub, uh, uh, a sector expertise. So it could be in the environment, could be in gender and women's rights, um, could be in education. They're often a, a math, mathematician or a statistician. Um, so they understand how to analyze lots of large data sets and they have some computer science skills so that they can actually write the programs to, uh, to do that analysis or, or tweak and update them. Um, so that is the, uh, so that's the actual definition of a data scientist. And the field and sector has been expanded so broadly to mean any sort of manner of a uh, person who works on collecting, organizing, updating, disseminating, analyzing data. Um, but it is important to be able to say uh, what level of skills your project actually needs. Most projects don't need machine learning. Most don't need artificial intelligence. Um, but you'll see that there's a lot of interest to say, hmm, we really need blockchain for this project. You probably don't. Um, and I think the, the, the real question to be able to address is um, what is the level of of technical expertise that is truly needed uh, for this work. Um, and if in the application for funding, you're actually asking for support for that, um, to hire a new person or for an external organization to give you a free, you know, in-kind support for data science, for data analysis, you know, why have you been able, how have you been able to choose that that's the right position that you need? Um, you know, what kind of outcome are you expecting from this work um, and why is that the position that's really needed? Um, being able to identify that is a whole field in itself. Um, there are some organizations that are trying to help with that. DataKind is one of them. Um, but I think that that's really a service that is vital and can be expanded to help organizations look at um, their, the quality of the data that they have and the amount of technology talent that they have on staff and identify what kind of um, additional talent, what additional team member would really be helpful and whether that's somebody that needs to be hired, um, hired long-term, hired short-term, or can be given as a donation, um, you know, or in-kind support through, uh, through funding. Um, so I am ever looking for great organizations that are uh, prepared and willing to do that. I know data kind is one, and I would love to hear any ideas from others um, of good experiences you've had from, from those who's been able to provide it. Um, ethics, privacy, and security. Um, so this is Joy Bualamini. Uh, she is um, uh, now Dr. Dr. Bualamini um, and has just uh, finished her dissertation on facial recognition technology and, and bias in the system. Um, so I don't think I need to tell anyone here how biased data can be um, and how biased the data analysis can be, how the data is collected, how it is used, um, and how it is organized, how it is shared, who gets access to it. And uh, this is now an increasingly, thankfully, um, a very uh, well-known problem and, and topic. And so the question to ask is, what are your 
what is your data? What are your data ethics principles? How are you ensuring the security and privacy privacy of your data and, and its solution? Um, have you looked at the digital principles? Are you in compliance with them? Um, which ones are you uh, working most directly toward? <clears throat> and uh, an ambiguous question of what happens in the worst case scenario. So always being able to say this is um, this is what we expect to happen. This is the goal. This is where we're going to go. But in the worst case, if the data falls into the wrong hands, how could this happen? Um, and what would be the impact of it? Uh, because that happens too often. Um, there's some really terrible cases with uh, even UNHCR um, sharing the data of Rohingya refugees um, with, uh, with Myanmar military leadership. And um, you know, once you have your personal data shared, there's really no place that you can, um, can be free from it. So uh, being able to speak to what happens if the data falls into the wrong hands and, uh, and how are you securing that information? Um, how are you collecting it well? All of those are pretty vital. All right, the important budget. <laughs> I mean, these are all important, but um, you really wanna be able to drill down on your budget. Uh, one of the biggest um, omissions that we see on budget is, uh, is there's just funding for staff. And, um, and there's so much involved in a project's process that needs support. Um, so learning, monitoring, evaluation, sometimes there's data cleanup. Um, uh, usually there's sort of a 15 cent flat for, for overhead, but uh, you know, just making sure if there are going to spe be specific expenses like office space, um, staff benefits, that all of that is included. Um, there are very, there's very often that we'll get a, a request for for funding and the budget is just so big and there are um you know uh one number followed by however many zeros after it so it doesn't really look like someone's really done their due diligence on how much could this actually cost um so being specific is really appreciated uh but it also has happened that we'll look at a budget and say I think that's too small. I don't think that you're going to be successful with it. And we'll actually increase the budget of the work. Um, that will happen when the project is specific and the budget is really specific. So I think that, I guess my best is to say specificity is rewarded. Um, and you all, I'm sure, have put together many, many budgets. But being able to walk through all the milestones of the project and to um, and to match that against the kinds of resources, the kinds of activities that would be needed throughout, um, that will help you with your timeline and that will help you with your budget as well. Uh, so being able to map all of that out is really important. And there's a lot of budgets that come through and they're just wanna hire staff and build more staff. And that is understandable, but if you're only hiring staff for the term of the project, then it's probably pretty rare that the project is going to last or the work is gonna last beyond the time of funding. So really thinking about um, what is, how it, will it be sustainable and how will it continue on? Okay, these last two sections. Um, ask for support. So being really specific. Uh, this one I think is so helpful um, and really helpful to donors is to say to them specifically, here's what I need from you. And often, you know, we're talking about pitching for funding support, it's money. But it, one of the things that donors love to do is they love to form partnerships themselves. So being able to say, um, you know, what we really need are, we really wanna have data visualization in here. We don't have a lot of data visualization expertise on the team, but we have some people who really wanna learn. So what we need are some trainings in data visualization and some licenses, um, and here are, two or three organizations that we think do that work really well. So if you can help us chase down that partnership, that would be really helpful. And that's great because it is a lot easier for a donor to find someone else to give them in-kind support and to join a project than it is just to um, try to, to raise funds. Um, so that's really helpful. So what's the specific technical tool that you need? What kind of training do you need? What kind of professional development does your team need? Um, and then another is if there's introductions to people and to say, you know, uh, in six months when this project is off the ground, we think that 
um, World Food Program would really be interested, and specifically their their data team. So if you can introduce us to the head of that team, you get the name, um, and you say, you know, uh, perhaps so we could join these upcoming conferences. If you could put us on panels with these organizations, you know, really being specific in the kinds of requests. Donors love that because it shows that you know the landscape and um, that they can use their their clout not just for getting funding, but actually for forming the kinds of partnerships and coalitions that can help you. And then the last is um, getting from insight to impact. So there's a lot of times that um, the work uh, the work done is is finished and there's a, a report written that said. You know, and here's what we learned, and um, and we did a lot of good work, and we're hoping to get more funding to be able to uh, continue the learning and continue the growing, which is absolutely important. But really, the 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 moment that we're in, there's been a lot more focus on what's the impact of your work. It wasn't always that way. So it it for very for a significant amount of time, it was just this sounds like a good idea. You do good work. This is a good project. Go forth and, and here's let's support it. But now there's like this very, um, very focused uh, interest in show me what the results are and show me what the impact is. So again, going back to that, if this, then that. If you give us support, then you're going to see this result. Um, going back to the, you know, who are you serving? Here's how they're showing. Here's how they can recognize that their, their lives have been changed and improved. So uh, all of this, the reason for all of these kinds of um, this tracking, these these patterns that we've seen are all present um, in those projects and in those organizations that have been able to say, with this, we will be able to meaningfully measure exactly how this has had an impact and how our work has, um, has helped someone's life. So uh, with that, I will close the presentation part. And I think we have... Um, some minutes at the end for questions and for any, if any have projects that they are actively working on now um, that they want to walk through, if that would be helpful to you, or if you have any feedback for me, um, I'd welcome that. So thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm just going to have an open conversation. If people want to take their, their mic off and chat, feel free. Um, and so I'm just reading from the um, from the comments here. Office space and spa staff benefits like what? I'm always afraid to do this. So often uh, when you see a, a budget proposal, there's usually about 15% or 18% that's just overhead. And you always put that in as overhead. But if the project requires that you're renting new office space, you know, or you're getting, we need additional uh, data to get this project done, internet access is what I mean by data. Um, then putting that into the project is totally is very valid. Um, there, the fifteen percent overhead can mean um, the staff benefits and the internet access. Sometimes that's just insurance um, and being able to have enough uh, funding for the kind of professional development work that you need to do, or for the project development of going out and finding other funders. So I think it is, what I would what I would recommend is ask for the things and if you get pushback, then you can address it. But what you don't wanna be caught do in a situation is, is picking, picking, picking through um, a very limited budget because, um, because you didn't ask for everything that the project would pull from your team is what I would say. Um, and just we had a, a previous, a very recent experience where we had an organization ask for some things that we thought, huh, we thought this would be in your overhead. And they were able to justify to say, no, our overhead is going towards all of the other, uh, you know, the project work, the work that we have to do to be able to pitch out the, the other team space and other office space. That's a standard overhead that we have. So for this project, this is specifically what we're pulling in. And that made total sense. They got funded. Um, so, do you, if you have a, if you have a, if you have existing office space already, you can still do a cost because obviously the staff would work from an office space and location, and the project will also uh, run in an office space. Can you 
put yeah, something think, there? How, how do you quantify that? I think the, the point is, if you're 15% or, or however much you charge for overhead, 15 is very low. Usually things are like 23%, 28%, but a lot of um, a lot of foundations and fundings max their overhead at 15%. Um, which is often too low for the what the project actually does. So then you can pull out specifically what you're working on. And you can say, hey, yeah, we have this for office space, but um, we're, we're now using that office space, not for another project, but for your project. So here's how much that section of the office costs. So you don't have to just say, oh, let's call it $200. It's like, no, we, we mapped out the office. Here's how much it costs. Here's how much that internet access is going to cost. So for this project, here's what we're asking for. And I, what I would say is, you know, none of none of what I can say is universal because I can only speak for myself and my experiences with these organizations. So I, everything always comes with what we say a grain of salt. But um, I have found that specificity is really rewarded because it shows an understanding of your field, understanding of your team, and understanding of the problem. So um, that's what I would say. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, okay, Linda says- When it comes to, sorry, just my last question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, even though I know Katrina, I don't get this opportunity every day. So <laughs> yeah, so please, when it comes to the staff benefits, what exactly can you include in, in, in the staff benefits? So staff benefits are, um, again, it, the question is how much do you usually have for overhead? But staff benefits are everything from healthcare and, you know, it's everything that you would provide to an actual staff. Is it healthcare? Is it professional development? Is it training? Is it retreats? Um, so usually you don't break that down, but whatever your current overhead is for your staff. And it's different in different countries. I think in Kenya, it's like 32%, which is absolutely like the highest I've ever seen. Um, but, uh, but you know, when you have the, in your salaries, sometimes people will look at a salary and say, well, why is that so high? And then you say, well, because we have to have this overhead for staff benefits. And so you're able to put that kind of line, line item in. Um, and so, and you can say either this is what Mobile Web Ghana says to provide, or this is what's mandated by um, by the by the country, by the region. Does that help? Okay. Okay. Linda says, when I'm drafting a budget for a data project, how do I make sure I'm able to fit into the budget range determined by the donor agency or the or the giver of a grant? Um, I mean, how, how do you make sure you're able to fit into? I think what you got to start with is how much do you actually need to get the work done? Um, and I, I'd start there. Um, so if you're looking at what project you're trying to do and you have sort of your wish list of here's what will make sure that this project is excellent. Um, and then you figure out what is that budget? And again, I think one of the things that I find really helpful and I've found helpful for others in, in doing budgeting is, uh, you know, if it's supposed to be a 24 month project, put down a timeline. What are the milestones for that project timeline? I mean, this might sound obvious, but it's can, can be more helpful than not. And, and what are the markers along that timeline? And then once you have sort of the calendar mapped out, you're able to say, here's how often I would need to do an evaluation, uh, clean up the data, um, write up a report, share and disseminate the findings. And each of those has a line item budget associated with it. Here's what staff I would need at this time. And so you're able to write out a budget based on that. Um, sometimes uh, donors don't give you any sort of range at all. Um, sometimes they'll give you the, the small and the large. And because you don't know what they're thinking, they really know what they're thinking, quite honestly. We really know what we're thinking, quite honestly. Um, uh, I think you just have to be very true to whatever budget it is that is going to be most helpful to you um, because then you'll be able to defend it. Um, I have been uh, on projects where we have to get out a set amount of funding by the end of the year. And, uh, and so they'll just look for, they'll prioritize and look for projects that are that score very high. So they're all, you know, sort of finalist projects, but the ones that meet that budget 
which could be high or it could be very low, are the ones that are going to get through. And you, you just you won't know. Um, and so I'd also just say that, yeah, so I so I think that the point is whatever budget you need is the one that you should ask for. Um, and if you don't get funded, it's it's not it's not <laughs> because you had a bad project. It can be as simple as the donor ran out of funding. They had that sort of chunk of four hundred thousand dollars that they had to get out at the end of the year, and uh, they were just looking at the right match of projects that that met their funding and met their timeline. Um, so I think the really the best that you or any of us can do is just to be true to the work that we have. Um, I will say it is very helpful to be able to prepare um, and not to spend too much time on this preparation, but to have an idea of you know, what happens if they come back and say, what can you do for 20% less? Um, what happens if they come back and say, what could you do if we gave you 20% or 50% more? Because that happens often. Um, and uh, again, that just usually comes down to donors have a certain amount of funding that they have to get out the door. Um, it's a very strange system, but that's the system that we have right now. Um, and so being able to have sort of in the back of your mind here's what we need minimum in order to be successful. Uh, here's what we'd like to have successful. And if we had all of the resources, here's what we could be able to do. So sort of that low, medium, high. Medium should be what you're really asking for. That's your sweet spot. But those other edges are, um, are often useful to, to be able to speak to. So, um, and again, none of this, all of this is just based on actual experiences. Um, I don't think I have the ability to share the specific applicant stories, but none of this is just something I'm thinking of. These are these are specific <laughs> uh, specific examples from from uh, uh, a few few years and decade of, of evaluating and, and allocating funds. Um, Princess Ndom asks, how about projects in the early stages led by young people who have no office space, use limited resources, but are data-driven? Can they be eligible considered? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I think the, the trick about the that kind of early, we are young, we, um, we haven't gotten funding before, those projects do get funded. Um, they probably don't get a, a big budget because uh, donors want to see a track record of you know how to manage a budget and you know how to do the work. Um, so I would go for those sort of mini grants or smaller donors to be able to build up an evidence base of here's how, how here's how well we steward funds and, and steward people's resources. Um, I will say there's one of the, one of the the problems with funding is that if you do grant management, if you're a donor and you do grant management, it takes as much time to manage a grant that's $250,000 or $2.5 million as it does to manage a grant that's $2,500. Um, so they're often incentivized to give more money. Um, and, uh, and so I would just, you know, asking for Smaller amounts doesn't mean like, oh, it's only $2,500 or it's only $250. So I'll just let you like, here, please take it. Um, it. It unfortunately doesn't work that way because they still need to be able to show that they have you that they understand the project, that they know all the ins and outs, they have to have the same amount of meetings. So, um, so it is harder to get those early smaller grants. Um, but I'd go for, there are, there's, there are organizations that have mini grant funding, um, and I would uh, I'd recommend applying to those to build up that kind of evidence base. Um, and Princess, if you want to talk through a specific project you're thinking of, I'm happy to talk through that. Um, Bryce said, I enjoyed the presentation. Thanks, Bryce. <laughs> I wish I knew how to convince organizations to collaborate in opening up data. Yeah, me too. I really wish. Um, I've been working on trying to convince governments to open up data for about the past 15 years. Um, governments can be easier than organizations themselves. Uh, how you convince organizations to open up data is basically the best that I've been able to to find is by, um, you know, 
it's, this all sounds so obvious, but you show what's in it for them. And you show that sort of if this, then that. If you open up your data, if you share your data with me, if you share your data with the public, then this is the impact that it's going to have on people's lives. Here's how you'll help. Most people who are in the space want to believe that they're really useful and that they're really helping people. Um, so here's how you're helping others. But also um, most organizations are really driven by um, how they show up in the press and in the media. So uh, you know, if you're opening this up, then here's how people are going to really perceive your organization. Um, here's how you'll build trust. Here's how you'll build um, you know, more people wanting to work with you and more people wanting to, to, uh, to trust your organization. Um, so I, I really have found that using the media um, and using events has an effect. Um, when we host events and we have sort of a public, uh, a keynote, or we have a panel and we call it opening up data. And then we invite whichever foundation or organization that you're trying to uh, convince to open up their data and say, we'd love you to give a presentation on um, some data that you've opened up um, and how it's been useful in the community. That's very helpful because then that forces them to say, all right, in three months, I'm gonna be on a panel, I'm gonna give a presentation and here's how I'm going to speak to um, you know, a project. And by the way, here's the, here's Bryce has been asking me for months to open up this data so that uh, he can work on this project um, to, uh, 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 you know, to solve a problem. So that's going to give me a really good story to tell. So let me bring that forward. And I think the, the trick there is to try to not do it entirely on your own, you know, to host the conference on your own and to have the convincing on your own. So who can you go to who has that kind of clout? You know, there's Mozilla Foundation Festival that's coming up. Um, there's the Open Government Partnership Summit. So depending on which organization you're trying to target and say like, how can we use these public spaces to try to, um, to, try to push and convince? Um, I'm happy to talk through that if there's a specific uh, group that you're trying to, um, to push on. But um, it's a big issue and I just, I think using the public space is, is a great way to, to force some, some response. Um, how do you get it right with marketing to ensure sponsors are happy? Yeah, trying to manage for people's happiness <laughs> is really hard. Um, yeah, donors <laughs> especially. So how are they happy? I mean, it's impossible. It's, you, can't, you can't make people happy. Um, and I think you know the best that you can do is say, uh, here's what we said we'll do. Here's the contract that we said we'd do, and here we did it. I think that's that's what's really helpful. Is also is to say like, look, you can't be upset because we did the thing that we said we would do. What they really want are stories. Uh, I think the currency in this field is to be able to go around, to give speeches, um, to be on those panels, uh, to be talking in meetings and saying, let me tell you a really good story. So if you can get the impact of your work down to 250, 150 words, a nice photo, like that's incredible currency. That's really helpful because then that team can feed it up to their boss, can feed it up to their boss. And all of a sudden it's a story that they're telling in speeches and they're talking about. But it's it's often that we don't get really good soundbite stories or we get reports that are like quite long. And I think being able to tell the story well and quickly is is usually the the impact um you asked though specifically about marketing uh and i was trying to look at marketing in terms of how you get uptake from the community and how people are are um are learning and responding to the work that you're doing and i my hope is that that earlier part of the presentation where i was speaking about you know knowing who you're serving putting out that mapping of you know the landscape who are all those organizations and having a plan for consistently reaching out to them and engaging with them um, that's going to be effective um, and also make the the donors happy um, but i think just even having a plan for how you're going to do that is a lot more than a lot of organizations do so all right Thank you all. I really appreciate you taking the time to join me. Um, Thank you, Katrin. Yeah.